In this video series, we've been addressing the topic of wise and gentle influence, looking in scripture at Jesus' strategies and other wisdom we can discern. We've examined the kinds of conversations that are possible with people we're trying to influence. We use verbal influence tools such as asking good, open-ended questions, avoiding advice, and seeking that the people we influence are really hearing from God, not just from us. We have discussed addressing issues of sin by debunking the lies of sin as we exhort one another every day. We have talked about dealing with conflict and seeking peace, peace with others by serving, not judging them. We have discussed the role of confession in our relationships. These videos tacitly assume we have relationships with people asking for help and guidance, or at least a trust relationship exists where we can raise issues of sin and challenge false beliefs, debunking lies to help them move compassionately without judgment to the truth. But how do we influence people when we are unsure how open they are to our influence? One way Jesus did this was by telling stories. Jesus famously told many stories. Many of his stories, his parables, he said to his disciples when he was trying to deepen their understanding of his ministry and message, on forgiveness in Matthew 18, on prayer in Luke 11, on his being the good shepherd, John 10, on the disciples' relationships to him as vine and branches, John 15. Jesus also told stories when he was in a mixed crowd, one that included religious leaders like the Pharisees, casual listeners, and also his disciples, on the importance of hearing and acting on his word, Luke 8, 4 through 18, on God's love for sinners and Pharisees, Luke 15, 11 through 32, on money and its proper use, the parables in Luke 16. Now we're going to look at parables Jesus tells where Jesus is speaking with someone he is trying to influence. That person is not a disciple and perhaps may be an antagonist. First, I'll be reading from Luke 10, 29 through 37. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that same road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, and having poured oil and wine on them, then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Next I'll be reading from Luke twelve thirteen through 21 Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher! my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And then he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, Ah, I will do this, I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. God said to him, You fool! This very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. What do you notice about Jesus' use of parables in these situations? In these cases, Jesus' teaching began as a response to a question initiated by someone else. Jesus seemed eager to influence the lawyer who approached him in Luke 10, and the stray complainer from the crowd who wanted him to intervene in his family's inheritance issues in Luke 12. He wanted to influence them and others who might overhear the exchange, but he hadn't built enough trust with them to make a correction or challenge pointedly. So he tells them each a story, and through this, he can help them at least make a first step or two across the bridge to understand his implicit, sometimes not very implicit, challenge to them. Each passage we just heard is well worth studying for the points Jesus makes with these non-disciples. But I won't take the time to cover all those great points in this context. I have a series of books called Sketches of Leadership, and in book five of that series called Becoming Rich Toward God, I look at most of the parables of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, and I delve into these parables and other parables in detail in that book. I encourage you to take a look at that if you would like to. 
But instead, I want to point out here that Jesus told some of his best and most famous parables in answer to a question from a person who at least was skeptical and not a disciple. This includes the examples we've just looked at, and also perhaps the most famous of all of Jesus' stories, usually called the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, 11 through 32. You have likely heard pastors use stories in their sermons, in part to keep people interested because humans love stories. And in part, stories are used the way Jesus used parables. Those tracking with the stories are challenged by the story's point, while those whose hearts are distracted or distant see the stories wash over them. Jesus comments on his use of the parables in this crucial teaching in Mark 4, when he is teaching them about the parables. Reading Mark 4, just verses 10 through 12, and then again picking up at 21 and reading through 25. When he was alone, those who were around him, along with the twelve, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look, but not perceive, they may indeed listen, but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. He said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a bushel basket or under a bed and not on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given you. For to those who have, more will be given. And from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The disciples have just come to him to ask about a confusing set of parables he's told the crowd. The twelve and some others clamor for clarity. Before giving them anything else, he says they have already been given the secret of the kingdom of God. He divides the world into two groups, the insiders, like them, and those on the outside. The outsiders hear the parables but don't understand, or they might turn again and be forgiven. The insiders, who also don't understand the parables, get explanations pointing to grace, forgiveness, and salvation. Now, why wouldn't Jesus want outsiders to be forgiven? It seems clear that he doesn't. He speaks in parables and figures they don't understand. How will they ever come to have forgiveness? No, Jesus doesn't want outsiders to be forgiven. Instead, he wants them to become insiders. He wants them to come to him and ask questions. That is why those who did exactly that are the ones with the secret of the kingdom. He tells them, pay attention to what you hear. Those who do pay attention, who listen well, who ask questions and struggle with implications, are the good soil, and their efforts will be rewarded. Those who give little effort or attention receive little teaching and understanding. And in fact, over time, they lose even the little that they have. So stories are great when trying to influence a mixed group with people who trust us and people who don't as much, or when we're talking about sensitive topics that may raise tensions as we raise them. For example, Several times I have taken the initiative to speak with male friends about their struggles with sexuality and pornography. These are sensitive issues, and the conversation could have been difficult. I raise the issue in these cases by mentioning first my own struggles in this area, opening the door to a two-way conversation that could be challenging or at least revealing. When I have done this, I found that my story, in which case I can communicate my own compassion for sin in this area and hope for healing and relief, opened the other person to an honest and helpful conversation. In my previous video on gentle exhortation, I talked about debunking the lies of sin as an application of Hebrews 3, verses 12 and 13. Here is another example of trying to debunk the lies of sin, this time in your colleague Jay, a Christian believer at your workplace, where you do not know precisely how welcome your feedback or conversation with him will be. Consider how telling the story is a way to take the conversation to a deeper level than perhaps you have enjoyed before. Jay, a co-worker at your office, is a young Christian who has responded well to your friendly initiative. You have seen one another in social situations outside work. You have observed Jay in the office and on the road. He is a fast-moving, ambitious guy who drives aggressively and uses his horn often. Last week, Jay received word that he didn't get an important assignment he was hoping for. Upset, Jay has begun to find fault with anyone and everyone, including you. How could you begin with Jay? How are you doing? I've noticed these things. Are they connected? You need to build a relationship with Jay without being judgmental. What questions do you have? Is Jay aware of how he's treating people? Is he eager to grow? Jay, how do you see this decision? Where is God in it? How could this be viewed as an opportunity? What would you hope Jay could come to see? 
Jay's anger, impatience, entitlement, and or jealousy. I would want him to see the way sin has deceived him to believe that it is possible for God's good intentions for him to be thwarted by someone else's decision regarding his career. I would hope Jay can see God is allowing him to trust him. How might you reflect what you see in a hearable way? You likely have your own story of an initially disappointing event that was later revealed to be a work of God's grace and love for you, though you didn't recognize it at the time. After you express compassion over his disappointment and share a similar story, you could follow with something like this. Jay, I'm praying for you that you'll be able to see how God is at work for your good in this job. I think you'll enjoy it more, and that enjoyment will produce better results for you than your current evident frustration. If you sense that Jay is resistant to your initiative and not eager to talk about things, your conversation will not likely go very far. If he hears your story and quickly excuses himself, I think you have your answer that he doesn't have ears to hear for now. Of course, that might change in the future. But if he asks about your story or relates in a way that he shares more, or if Jay thanks you for your interest and perspective, all these are signs that perhaps he has receptivity to your influence and is open for more. More words, more expressions of confidence in God's work, more thoughts about how to embrace a different posture toward his past and his likely future disappointments. Of course, there is a danger in telling stories. Most of the stories Jesus told were short. They could be told top to bottom in five minutes or less. If I tell a long, complicated, detailed story focused on my past and experience, it may become clear to the listener that this story being told isn't really intended to help them understand their own situation, but just a chance to draw the focus to myself and either my sorry state or my heroic actions. This does not help anyone and certainly is likely to undermine our efforts to listen well and gently influence our friends. When you tell your story, keep it short. If the person has ears to hear, then perhaps they may ask you for more details or more of your reasoning or for the end of the story. In that case, those who have can be given more. When we as disciples of Jesus seek a wise influence in the lives of others, we will ask God for wisdom as Solomon did and the book of James counsels. We will begin to see the opportunities we receive all the time to use our words to influence others for good in a wise, gentle fashion through questions, stories, and invitations to receive more. I just have a few questions for reflection. First of all, if you're a parent of a teenager or trying to influence a beloved person in your life who nevertheless is not reliably open to your influence, telling stories can be an effective door of entry into a deeper conversation. How have you seen this be true in your relationships with such people? Secondly. Who are the people with whom stories might be a good entry strategy for an influential conversation? What stories do you have from your own life, from scripture or history that may be helpful? Thank you for watching this video. If you did, please like this video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And if you think of someone who might benefit from this video, please send them the link. You'll be helping them and helping me get the word out also. Thanks.